Alright guys, BLM here back with a new video and in this video for the 10th anniversary of the game that radically changed the way I look at gaming with its almost solely narrative focused approach. Here I will be talking about Telltale's The Walking Dead now labeled Season 1, which is a game that I adored when it came out. With this being one of the first games I played that was meant to be played almost solely for its narrative and for its branching storylines that would have subtle changes based on the way you played it. Which this genre of graphic adventure games are now one of my favorite genres in the gaming medium having now played the following Telltale games and the Quantic Dream games and the Life is Strange series and my love of all of these do harken back to how much I loved The Walking Dead Season 1 here. Now I would replay this game over and over and over again to see every single scenario that was possible in the game. I mean there are many scenes in this game that I remember word for word and really this is one of the games i have the most nostalgia for at this point despite its short sides i do find this one of the best games telltale has ever made with the most gripping narrative and compelling characters that despite the plot kind of just meandering at points and the voice acting not really being the greatest either to me this game still tells one of my favorite stories in the gaming medium and really set the standard of what telltale could do with their game structure that despite making some solid games after the fact, I do think they struggled to replicate the magic that they had with the first Walking Dead game here, and the run through why I'll be talking about the game from beginning to end, and I can assure you this is going to take a very long time. But with that, let's start by talking about episode one, A New Day, which ends up being a great introduction to the series here with it showcasing most of what would become standard tropes of Telltale games moving forward while introducing us to a interesting cast of characters and this really interesting dynamic between Lee and Clementine that ends up carrying this game. Now obviously future episodes end up perfecting the formula that this episode starts with them doing more than the baseline that this episode achieves but considering it's the first outing for this series I do think they did a pretty good job at introducing it and premiering it here. But now let's run through the episode itself, which starts with a scene that I feel like I've seen hundreds of times, where we get introduced to our protagonist, Lee Everett, as he is on his way to prison, having been convicted of killing a state senator that had an affair with his wife. And in this opening scene, we do have the officer driving him to prison, trying to have a conversation with him, which does serve as an introduction to how dialogue choices work in this game, with you having the option to stay quiet, and you also having a time limit to decide on your answers. But through this, you obviously pick up on the context behind this scene as slowly builds up Lee's character with the officer saying that he's different than other criminals for not declaring that he didn't do it. Which easily tells you that Lee is inherently a good man that got caught up in a bad situation here. But across the scene, you could tell something is going on here with police cars and helicopters passing by. The officer's radio continues to go off, all being fun foreshadowing to this being the start of the outbreak. And really, I do think this being the start of Lee's story here gives Lee an interesting perspective on the outbreak, where he was at his lowest point before the outbreak. And the events after the outbreak are actually what allows him to display the positive traits in his character and what gives him purpose but either way the scene ends with the officer crashing into a walker causing the car to ride off the side of the road knocking lee out where he awakens some time later and we escape the wrecked car to find the officer unconscious on the ground and lee approaches him to get the key to unlock his handcuffs and while doing so lee hears a groan from the officer where we get the reveal that he has now become a walker attacking Lee here, giving us our first action scene in the game, most of which are kind of annoying to me, especially in the original release of the game where inputs were extremely laggy and there were a lot of sections where you had to use the cursor in order to interact with an object and those sections could come off very wonky, though obviously that aspect of the game has improved in every iteration of the game that's come out since then. But even without that, I do still find these sections pretty monotonous as it mostly just comprises of you moving the cursor to the right spot at the right time and again, kind of dull to me. But we do have Lee struggling to load the shotgun. That adds some suspense to the scene, but it obviously concludes with Lee's first walker kill here. But as he does so, Lee notices a figure watching him from the distance and calls out to it before the walkers end up approaching him, leading to him limping his way into a suburban backyard, where Lee ends up entering the house which he finds in a disturbing state, 
void of life and with blood on the floor, but we eventually listened to the answering machine where we learned that the owners of this house were on vacation while the daughter was under the care of a babysitter. But the message continues to get more disturbing where we learned that the husband was attacked by a crazy guy, clearly being a walker, and later hear the message of the mom crying as she repeats her love for her daughter as it becomes clear that she knows that she'll never see her again. And this is where Lee hears the voice of the child coming from a walkie-talkie, this child being the daughter of the homeowners, turning out to be Clementine, who gets a great intro here with her tragic backstory being told to us immediately before meeting her, but also us getting to see that she is a resourceful little girl here, having set up camp in her treehouse in order to avoid the walkers. She also tells Lee that he's being too loud and that he has to be quiet, showing the intelligence of Clementine really early on, and also exemplifying this Lee and Clementine relationship that really is the core of this game. And I do feel like your enjoyment of this game will come down to how much you buy into this Lee Clementine foster father-daughter relationship that I'll be honest, feels extremely generic nowadays. I mean, stories like this are a dime a dozen. I mean, even less than a year later, we had The Last of Us do a very similar story conceptually and do it in a much more complex way that subverts your expectations, while I feel like The Walking Dead here tells a more baseline narrative that follows the more traditional tropes. Though I still enjoy this approach to the game as well, but in the middle of our initial conversation with Clementine, we do end up getting attacked by her babysitter, now a walker. We have another action scene here that ends up with Clementine showing up to save us by handing us a hammer that we use to bash her skull in, once again showing Clementine as a capable companion to Lee in this zombie apocalypse. But here we learn that Clementine has been waiting for her parents to return, and we have the two pairing up with Lee promising to look after her until everything gets fixed, which obviously is going to happen, leading us to our first major choice in the game where we have to leave the house to look for help, and we get to determine the time of day here, which these major choices in most Telltale games don't typically matter, like they don't typically have a major impact on the narrative, as obviously that would take a lot more writing, a lot more time to create all these scenes, it usually just leads to a singular scene that is different with a character swapped out or some changed dialogue, and then maybe some minor dialogue changes moving forward. Typically nothing that has true major ramifications on the overall plot, which is obviously a criticism of Telltale Games and the fact that we have seen companies like Bioware and Quantic Dream attempt this more ambitious style of storytelling where there are more radical changes, while obviously in this game most of them just lead to minor changes. But no matter what time you decide to go, you will still end up interacting with Sean Green, who helps you escape and takes you to Herschel's farm. But the person he is there with changes based on when you decide to go. During the daytime, he is there with his friend Chet, while during the night, he is there with a police officer named Andre Mitchell. Though interestingly, this decision does also end up changing the following scene, where Herschel is more likely to believe the severity of the situation if you choose nighttime, as in that scenario, Chet has already died. And obviously, if he's not dead, then Herschel takes the situation a lot more lightly. But along the way, we do obviously get our first interaction with others after Lee and Clementine's partnership, where we can decide on whether or not to tell Sean the truth about it, which in doing so does have an impact on how Herschel ends up treating you, as he will either believe your story or not based on your choices here, with this essentially seeming like a tutorial to how your choices will matter in future installments. But then we arrive on Herschel's farm, where we obviously get introduced to Herschel, the first of the major characters from the comics to make their way into the game, which, to be fair, there's not a lot of, with most of those appearances happening in this first episode, seeming like it was done in a way to attach the fans of the comics in the TV show, but also allowing them to tell their own story moving forward. But Herschel here, I've always liked how he was portrayed, though it does come off as a bit over the top, though really, I mean, that's the game for you. But again, the way that this initial conversation goes is determined by the choice that you made earlier, where again, Herschel can either take this situation seriously or not, though either way, Sean still decides to fortify the fence anyway, so again, it doesn't really matter that much. But also, you can choose how truthful you are to Herschel here, to where if you lie to him, he obviously ends up picking up on that. But again, either way, he will let you stay tonight. So again, it's still dumb. But that's the type of plot conveniences that you can expect from this game. But it does lead to Lee and Clementine sleeping in the barn where we do get a nice little interaction between the two that seems to further bond them while also re-solidifying that Clementine still wants to go to Savannah to find her parents while Lee still has nightmares over the murder that he committed. But then we jump into the next morning where we do get introduced to the other family that was spending the night at the farm 
First starting off with Kenny, who obviously becomes one of the major characters here, not just in this season, but also season two as well. But also one of these characters that your relationship with them is heavily determined on the choices that you make, where he can either become Lee's best friend or a rival figure instead, based on whether or not you tend to agree with him. But also here we get introduced to his wife Katja and his son Duck, with Katja coming off as this generic motherly figure and Duck being this generically over-eager kid that goes off to help Sean fortify his fence, but this all provides us with our first truly explorable area in the game where we can walk around the farm, interact with objects, talk to each of the characters within it, getting to know these newer characters better. Talking to Kenny leads to him revealing his plan to go escape on a boat, which might come up later. Talking to Katja leads to you learning about her and Kenny's background, but not much of actual significance moving forward outside of learning the fact that she's a veterinarian. Now, after talking to Sean, which is a conversation that most comprises of Sean being perturbed by the current situation, we do end up seeing Herschel enter the barn where we go to talk to him, which is where we see the ramifications of our previous discussion, where Herschel will continue to interrogate Lee for a bit, during which we learn that Lee's family is from Macon, conveniently the city that Kenny stated that he was heading out for, but here Herschel will give Lee advice, which again differs a bit based on whether or not you lied to him, which if you do, he scolds you and tells Lee to become a better liar, but either way, he does tell Lee that he needs to rely on the honesty of strangers moving forward, and that essentially your choices will have consequences, which is essentially the developers screaming out to you that you have to be careful about the choices you make here, and obviously Herschel is a conduit for that. But then we do hear Sean screaming from the outside, leading to Lee running out to save him, finding Sean's legs pinned under the tractor that Duck had accidentally run him over with, while we have walkers attacking from outside the fence, and we get our next major choice in the game. And the first one that feels like it actually matters at the time of saving either Sean or Duck. Now in Telltale fashion, either way, Sean is killed here, which is the moment referred to in the comics, so again, cool for fans to see the scene in actuality. Though obviously, technically, this isn't canon anyway, but really this is a choice of whether or not the side with Kenny. As also, either way, Kenny saves Duck, but if you end up hoping save Duck, that obviously gives you favor with him. Well, going for Sean gains you favor with Herschel, which doesn't matter as this is Herschel's last appearance anyway, but that option will obviously harm your relationship with Kenny. Either way, Herschel is horrified as his son gets killed and has his really over-the-top acting as he kicks Kenny and Lee off his barn, which is a moment that for some reason has always lingered in my mind. But of them being kicked out, no matter what side you end up choosing, Kenny still allows Lee and Clem to tag along with them to Macon, which is ridiculous if you didn't side with him, though this is where you start to realize the way the writers are utilizing Clementine in the story as she's used as a way to rationalize this. Again, a common occurrence across the game here of Clementine warming up Lee to strangers and this being used by the writers to explain some irrational situations. But then the group arrives in Macon, conveniently running out of gas just as they get there, and as expected, we get attacked by a group of walkers, during which Duck gets attacked by one of them, and that's when we get saved by another group that ushers us into a nearby drugstore for safety, and once inside, we see an argument erupting between this new group, where Carly and Glenn, the two that saved us, are being confronted by Lily and Larry, this father-daughter duo, that instantly come off as antagonistic figures for Lee here and continue to be a foil for him moving forward. But this leads to Larry recognizing that Duck has walker blood on him, assuming that he has been bitten, adding Kenny into this argument. And this is a really tense scene with Kenny threatening Larry. We have Katja frantically trying to prove Duck wasn't bitten and Larry just yelling at him like a maniac here. And here we have to decide who to side with here in siding with Kenny or Larry. And to me playing this naturally, I just don't know why you would ever side with Larry here where... It just feels weird to be siding with this raging lunatic you just met over the guy that just trying to protect his son. But again, the true ramifications of this decision is whether or not Kenny trusts you moving forward. Though finally, if you do side with Kenny, you can egg him on the trying to knock out Larry to which Larry ends up striking him down instead. But again, either way, we find out that Duck wasn't bitten and we are allowed to stay. So again, another choice that doesn't really play a factor on the current plot but one that does have ramifications moving forward. But throughout this scene, we do have Clementine constantly talking about needing to go to the bathroom, only for her to get attacked by a walker as she enters the bathroom, leading to a short action sequence 
that does largely feel unnecessary, though Carly does end up being the one coming to the rescue, kind of establishing her character at this point, and making her an instantly likable one at that. But this causes Larry to lash out at her again, only for this time to cause him chest pain, with Lily explaining that he has heart problems and needs pills from inside the pharmacy, giving us our next objective. But at this point, we can walk around the drugstore and talk to everyone inside, and this ends up taking up a bulk of this episode. And really, this section is probably the most that this game feels like a traditional adventure game, where again, a lot of this game is more story or action focused, but this is a section that is largely a puzzle section, where finding your way into the pharmacy does require a lot of strange sequences of events that aren't immediately predictable, and you have the fine objects around the world to get these events to occur, and again, this is a lot of what you would expect from an older PC adventure game. But the first step to finding your way in is to go to the office, where Lee and Clementine go in alone, and this is where you start to figure out that this drugstore was conveniently owned by Lee's parents, being his family's business, which seems like a major convenience, but is one that does greatly propel Lee's character here, having him have to deal with the acknowledgement that his family is now dead, making him a more sympathetic figure here, while also allowing his revealing of this information to be a bonding moment with him and certain other characters. But this is a pretty morbid scene of him seeing a puddle of blood on the ground that he knows comes from his parents. He finds out that his father was hurt while trying to protect his mother. Then we find a family photo that he looks at fondly before ripping himself out of it to keep his identity a secret, as this does become a key item that we need to use moving forward. But this is where Carly comes into the scene, revealing that she knows who he is and that she will keep his secret, but warns him to not cause any issues with the group. And while you can react negatively here, no matter how you react, if Carly is alive moving forward, it does cause Carly to become Lee's closest confidant in the next few episodes. And this scene also does a lot to further the Lee and Clementine bond with them moving the desk that was barring the door to the pharmacy together, where Clementine ends up injuring her finger and Lee has to bandage it up. Lee ends up telling Clementine about his backstory and how he has killed someone, which she ends up accepting his explanation here. And Carly and Clementine end up being the only characters at this point that he ends up being fully truthful in all aspects of his life at this point in the story. Also, while here, we do find a TV remote that for some reason also becomes a key item that's just kind of weird. But afterwards, we do return to the main store where we can check up on the others. Kenny's interaction obviously is based on whether or not you backed him up beforehand. Though here we can decide to be honest with him over the fact that our family owned this drugstore. Lily and Larry's convo goes similarly with Lily treating you differently depending on what side you picked. Though realistically, either way, she does still come off as a pretty cold character here. We can talk to Carly who is trying to fix her radio and we get a fun character moment from her with her not recognizing that the reason it's not working is because it doesn't have any batteries. And if you want, you can go find batteries around the store and through that fix her radio, which conveniently leads to her listening in just as the news is told to go off air and evacuate by a government order, which is perfect timing, but also does show you the severity of the outbreak here. But eventually, Clementine's walkie-talkie goes off, with Glenn speaking through it after he had previously left for a search for fuel at a nearby motel, and here he asks for help, leading to Lee and Carly going off to save him, taking us to the Travelier Motel, where we get this weird action slash puzzle set piece where we do find the motel surrounded by walkers but glenn reveals that a woman is hiding in one of the rooms upstairs and we agree to help glenn save her and to do so we have to kill all the walkers in the area silently which leads to a really convoluted sequence of events where you have to kill certain walkers in a particular order but along the way we do end up finding an axe that does become another key item needed to enter the pharmacy but we do end up rescuing the girl only to find out that she is already bitten and after seeing carly's gun she asks for it so that she can kill herself giving us another decision here Though this is one that has some pretty minor ramifications, as either way, the girl ends up being successful in being able to kill herself, though you can choose to either give her the gun, which leads to Lee solemnly accompanying her as he allows her to pull the trigger, or you can not give her the gun, which leads to her attacking Carly to get it, causing the balcony to collapse, and in the wreckage, the bitten girl grabs the gun anyway and kills herself anyway. So again, conclusion is inevitable anyways, but through this section, it does clear out the motel, allowing it to be our base for a while after this episode. But eventually, the group obviously ends up returning to the drugstore, where we have to finish out the puzzle of getting into the pharmacy, which ends up concluding here with us getting to know Doug, who had been the lookout for the group, watching the streets 
from within a security gate and here you can obviously look around the street and through doing so you end up seeing that Lee's brother is pinned under a pole across the street making searching his body the most likely way that we're going to be able to find keys. But here again we do have a really convoluted sequence of events to end up reaching him. We first have to convince Doug that the men across the street did work at the pharmacy which has us revealing to him the family photo. We then have to use the axe to break the lock on the gate but with the streets being surrounded by walkers we still need to find a way to distract them which is where the TV remote comes into play. We're using Using it allows us to turn on the TVs at the electronics store across the street. And the final piece of this puzzle is picking up a brick right outside of the gate that we end up throwing to the front window of the store to fully distract the walkers and we are finally able to cross the street where we do find Lee's brother zombified here which again allows you to sympathize for Lee's situation as he is forced to put down his brother here though obviously through this we do find the keys to the pharmacy leading us to the end of the episode where Lee and Lily use the keys to enter the pharmacy but through doing so set off the alarm leading to a massive set piece here where now the walkers are attacking the drugstore once again but now with the security gate being open are able to break through and we do end up helping Carly and Doug block the doors during which we have a weird moment where Carly's about to profess her love for Doug which obviously tragically gets cut short here when the walkers start to break through the windows leading to the group gang split up here for our first truly game-changing decision where both Doug and Carly get caught up at the same time leading to us having to make the decision of which one to save. A moment that I do think fully shows you that your decisions finally matter in this game where the character that you don't choose actually ends up getting killed here and the character that you do choose to save ends up being alive until episode 3. So again, this is a pretty major choice and one of the few that does have pretty major ramifications moving forward. But to me, this choice has always been pretty clear cut where I really don't understand why you wouldn't save Carly in an initial playthrough of this game with Carly clearly being set up to be in a more important character or being portrayed with more complexity throughout this first episode with her, with her clearly having this storyline with Lee being set up for future episodes while Doug is simply just there. And even if he does survive, I do feel like his writing is pretty inconsistent as it clearly feels like the developers intended on Carly surviving and seem to write the scenarios as if Carly survived, but at points just interchange the characters with Doug. And again, it just does not fully fit his character, especially by the time we get to episode three. But the scene does end with Clementine getting attacked once again, and we have the saver. But through this, we get separated from the group, allowing Larry to punch Lee in the face as he attempts to escape, leaving him for dead, which is a dick thing to do as we literally just spent the entire episode trying to save him but no matter what Kenny ends up coming back to save us with the one-liner he says changing based on the status of our relationship but this does continue this love-hate relationship that Kenny and Lee have here but then we get to the final scene of the episode where we do find out that the group has decided to settle at the motel where we do get this interesting section of approaching each faction within the group one by one, essentially doing these checkups with them. First, we have Glenn, who I've failed to mention up to this point, is obviously a major character within the comics, and his appearance here shows what happens to him immediately before the events of the comics, as he ends up leaving here in order to find his group of friends. We obviously end up thanking Kenny for saving us and find out his plans about staying at the motel for the near future. We end up hearing Carly slash Doug talk about their guilt over the other's death. Clementine reveals to us that her walkie-talkie broke during the escape, which upsets her as it obviously reminds her of her parents, which makes it so that Lee and Clementine are both dealing with the loss of their parents at the same time here, though obviously the walkie-talkie ends up being a major plot device moving forward. But we do end this with a conversation with Larry, where Larry reveals that he knows Lee's background as a convicted murderer, which obviously builds up more tension over how this conflict will play out. But the episode itself does end with the group hearing the military continuing to bomb the undead, thinking that's a hopeful sign, only for the power to end up going out, ending the episode with this shot of darkness. Which obviously just shows you the grim tone of the overall story and showcasing that help isn't on its way. But let's talk about episode 2, Starved for Help, which for me is an all-time great Walking Dead Telltale episode, telling a great individual story here, which gave time for each of the characters to shine and also gave us some really compelling villains. Though a minor complaint here is that in the context of the rest of the season, it does feel like one of the least important episodes of the season where you can really skip from episode one to three and only miss out on a couple important plot points so episode two here really just ends up being mostly episodic but it's still a great episode nonetheless 
But the episode does start three months after the conclusion of the previous episode, where we bizarrely start with Lee walking in the woods with a new character named Mark, a late entrant to the group as they attempt to hunt for food. And along the way, you obviously learn about what's happened in the time skip, particularly learning that Lee and Larry's relationship still hasn't improved, and also that Kenny and Lily are fighting the role of leader of the group. With again, long term, these debates really just determine your status with Kenny moving forward, Though short term, obviously, the choice between Kenny and Lily feels more important. But also here we learn that the group is running out of food, which really propels the entire plot of this episode. But eventually we do hear screaming and end up finding a group of three, with one of them being David, this teacher who has his leg trapped in a bear trap, while the others are two students in Ben and Travis, who are trying to help him out. And instantly we are given the decision of deciding whether or not to chop David's leg off in order to free him. With that being the only way to actually free him here, as you can waste time trying other options, but they don't work. If you don't rescue him, you end up leaving him for dead, which leads to Travis freaking out, getting him accidentally shot in the stomach, which has always felt dumb to me. While if you do chop David's leg off, it does lead to this really gruesome scene of you having to press for every chop, and you have David screaming out in pain the entire time, but... If you go with this route, then Travis ends up being attacked by a walker instead and ends up dying that way. But really, again, none of this truly matters as either way Ben survives and the other survivor just ends up being fodder for future action sequence where they will end up dead anyway. But then we return to the motel where Lily and Larry are obviously upset as they typically are. We're upset here at Lee bringing back people, now making it more people that they have to feed, but... We do see more of the Kenny Lily rivalry here with them arguing over this decision, and Lee gets his first opportunity to decide who to side with. Where here both choices have some pros and cons for future events, but either way, Lily ends up deciding to give Lee the decision of who to divvy out the day's rations to, with her tone while doing so obviously being determined on what side you went with. But well, then we are able to fully explore a motel, talking to each of the characters within the group, while handing out food to those that we decide to feed. The thing is, though, is that there's obviously only four pieces of food to distribute to ten people. And I really like this section, giving the player a lot more initiative to decide which relationships they feel are most important to them, as really, that's all this is. You give food to the people that you want to bolster your relationships with. Now, obviously, Clementine should be an obvious choice as someone to give food to. And when talking to her, she reveals that her hat has disappeared, which obviously feels like foreshadowing to a future event. Other than that, I typically give an apple to Carly, which is the only food that she ends up accepting. Then I end up siding with Kenny by giving him and Duck food as well. Though obviously if you're siding with Lily, you would give it to her and Larry. But no matter what your choices are here, you do end up being scolded by those that you don't feed and obviously supported by those that you do. Now along the way, you do also end up finding Larry and Mark working on the wall, which gives you a minor decision on who to give the axe to, which I always pick Mark, because, I mean, why would you give it to Larry? But also, you could talk to Ben for the first time here, who is understanding of why you wouldn't feed him, and instantly I do feel for him as someone who is now all alone, and is a character that I never understood the vitriol that he gets from a lot of the fan base, where, yeah, he is kind of useless, and he does mess things up for the group, but I do think his backstory here is kind of tragic and he's overall just a kind-hearted kid that ends up being misguided in a lot of the things that he ends up doing. Also, we end up talking to Katja, who is nursing the wounded survivor. Though either way, he ends up dying here and we get an action scene of having to fight off his reanimated walker here. Though afterwards, Ben gets scrutiny from the group for him not telling them that his friend was bitten, only for him to reveal to the group that they turn into walkers no matter how they die. Which is kind of a weird revelation for the characters here, as you would assume that they would have figured that out in the three months that's passed since the episode one, but instead this is made to be a big moment here. But shortly after this, we do find two other survivors approaching the motel, which leads to another minor change here, where if Doug is still alive, he makes this alarm system that makes you notice them earlier, but either way, the survivors end up introducing themselves as brothers, Andy and Danny St. John, who arrive looking for gas to power their generators at their dairy farm. And with the group lacking food here, they end up coming up with a trade that leads to Lee, Mark, 
whichever of Doug and Carly is still alive, and Ben going to the farm in order to scope things out. Now, technically, Lee can disagree with this plan, but he gets overturned anyway. But instantly, Andy and Danny obviously are supposed to come off as these unassuming, likable figures. And I do feel like that is the way I looked at them the first time I played this game as a kid. But in retrospect, obviously, the signs are there that they're a lot more devious than intended. Now, we do get a somewhat short scene walking to the farm where we do end up talking to Andy and Danny, talking about our group's dynamic, once again having to state which of Kenny or Lily we think is the leader but eventually you end up coming across a group of bandits where we get to see one kill another instantly showing you how dangerous and volatile this group is and on the offset setting them up as major antagonists for this episode though obviously that ends up changing but then we do arrive at the farm where you get introduced to the brother's mother in Brenda who comes off instantly as this overly generic nice southern mother figure but we end up hearing from her that the last of their cows is sick and with Katja being a veterinarian it allows allows us to broker a deal to have everyone come over for dinner at the farm in exchange for Katja caring for the cow. Which right off the bat, the fact that the St. John's have so much food despite their one cow being sick should be a major indicator here of what's to come, but for some reason I didn't pick up on it as a kid. But through this we do see Doug slash Carly return to the group to give them news of this deal while Mark and Lee stay to help clear the electric fence that surrounds the farm. Leading to more discussions around the current events from Mark and Lee as they clean the dead walkers off the fence, leading to them finding one where they have to hop over the fence in order to clear it. But after doing so, conveniently the fence turns back on, leaving them outside to be attacked by the bandits, which I will say the ramifications of this didn't quite click with me until a lot more recently. That the reason why the fence turns on here is deliberate by the St. John's, who want these two to die to use them as food, which again, for some reason I never fully pieced together until a few playthroughs ago, but it kind of works in their favor with Mark getting hit in the shoulder, leading to Brenda taking him inside to take care of him, but gameplay wise, this section really comes off as ridiculous to me, as we have this really dumb section of walking alongside the tractor using it as cover which the entire controls of this feel very floaty but eventually we are able to escape just as the motel group arrives and we do get to explore the farm for a bit while getting everyone's thoughts on the situation with lily in particular wanting to leave thinking that it's unsafe we also can do a bit of a side quest here and making a swing for the kids to play on which is a nice little moment for Lee and Clementine there, but really the story progresses with the St. John's now wanting to hunt down the bandits for breaking their truce, leading to Danny and Lee going off to a camp in the middle of the woods where they find some boxes from the dairy. And throughout all this, Danny comes off super sketchy, with him clearly trying to hide something. He sees Lee finding a camcorder, and we see Danny being relieved to find out that's lacking batteries. We do check inside the tent where we end up finding Clementine's hat. And at this moment, Jolene arrives and threatens to shoot the duo, her being this deranged woman that we assume is with the bandits, and here we get the choice of whether or not to shoot her. Though either way, she ends up dying here with Danny shooting her if we don't, which I do find dumb how like Danny instantly is appalled that Lee shot her if you choose to do so, which is ridiculous considering he was about to do it himself, but again, whatever. Returning to the dairy, we do see Kenny and Lily fighting as usual, but we find out that Kenny is suspicious of a locked door at the back of the barn, and we are tasked with finding a way to open it after Kenny makes a pretty ridiculous racist comment here and claiming that he's saying it because he's from Florida, but along the way, we also give Clementine her hat back that does lead to a little moment of her telling him that he will be a good dad someday. But going back outside, you are able to find a multi-tool which you can use the screwdriver to open the door, but first you need to distract Andy to get him out of the barn first, which leads to us sabotaging the generator in order to do so. But eventually we are able to open the door and are shocked to find large amounts of blood and torture devices inside, which leads to Andy sneaking up on Lee, telling him that dinner is ready, and claims that this is where they skin animals, which is a response that Lee accepts for now, but obviously sets up this ominous tone for what we eventually learn. But we do enter the house while everyone is starting to eat dinner, which leads to Lee asking for where the bathroom is, which allows us to explore the house. Finding some worrying signs of bloodstains on the floor, and we see a power switch that lights up a room connected to the bedroom, but blocked off by a bookshelf, to where we end up opening it to find Mark, barely conscious on the ground, having his legs cut off, and this is a extremely chilling scene. 
Now again, all the signs were there that the St. John's were cannibals, but for me, I didn't piece it together really at all on my initial playthrough. And this is a really fantastic reveal and such a dark way to progress the story here where Lee rushes down the stairs and depending on his dialogue options, you can stop Clem from eating any of the human meat. But this ends up being a really fun scene where Lee frantically tries to tell the group that this is a human slaughterhouse and we instantly have the St. John's admitting to this and having this sudden shift in tone and personality that is deeply disturbing as they try to rationalize their actions and the St. John's here end up overpowering the group just as Mark crawls his way to the dinner table. A really dark visual there. But the group does awaken in a meat locker where Katja and Duck have been taken somewhere else. But here we do see Larry pounding on the locked door, refusing to stay calm, leading to him having another heart attack, which is where we get a major decision here of helping Lily to try to revive Larry or helping Kenny in killing Larry. And either way, this is an extremely dark scene as either way, Kenny kills Larry right in front of Lily. But for us to be helping in this murder is obviously a brutal scene as well as Clementine is watching. And this also leads to Lily obviously scolding us if we don't help her and not helping us moving forward while siding with Lily causes Kenny to still kill him but also harms our relationship with Kenny. And realistically, like I do get Kenny's point of view here. I mean, it is logical to think that if Larry were to become a walker, it would be a very difficult walker to contend with considering his massive size. So again, I do think this is a decision that is a mostly complex one to where I don't even know what I personally think is the better option here from a realistic standpoint. But either way, I mean, this is really just another choice that determines this like Kenny versus Lily debate and I do find it funny how if you do nothing here you actually are able to get the best of both worlds with neither side taking umbrage with you which kind of minimizes the impact of the choice here but either way we do still have to find a way to escape the meat locker which we end up finding a vent that we have to unscrew and through a throwaway line that Larry had earlier in the episode we know that he has some change in his pocket which we need to grab using a screw in order to open the vent which can lead to a frosty reception from Lily if you cite it against her but here we do see Clementine being the only one small enough to fit through the vent, giving her a moment to shine here where she ends up being the one to unlock the door. And while we're in the back room, you can select what weapon Lee will use for the next scene, which is obviously a very minor choice, but again, cool they even gave you a choice there at all. But this leads to the rest of the episode being this pretty big action set piece of us facing off against the St. John's. First, we have to escape the barn where we do have Danny keeping guard and see him pulling out a bear trap, which is a fun little reveal that the St. John's were the ones to plant the trap that David was stuck in at the beginning of the episode. But here we end up hiding in a stall as we watch the discussion between Annie and Danny with us being able to peek out at points, though eventually when we do, Danny points his rifle directly at Lee's face, starting this fight sequence that leads to Lee getting saved by the one that he sided with in the Larry debate, where they knock him into his own bear trap, giving Danny a satisfying downfall here, though here we are given the choice of whether or not to kill him, which really doesn't play that much of a factor on the story here, though obviously if you do, Clementine ends up seeing it and is shocked by it, and also the stranger will eventually bring this up as a reason why you're unfit to look after her in the final episode. Though again, not really anything too, too major here in terms of the general plot. But beyond this, Kenny runs off to find his family while Lee ends up getting distracted by Doug slash Carly and Ben, who had originally stayed back to watch over the motel, but conveniently show up here having left their post for some reason. But then we get to the main house where we do get this weird standoff against Brenda, who's holding Katja captive where you do have to give specific responses to not piss Brenda off. And by walking closer to her after each of these responses, she ends up backing up to the point where a zombified Mark ends up biting her, allowing Katja to escape, which is another fitting death sequence for her to die by the hands of Mark there. But then we run out to find Kenny already confronting Andy, who is holding Duck hostage. Now this is where Doug slash Carly helped distract him, leading to us having our final fight against him, which is a pretty long action scene here of us avoiding getting pushed into the electric fence. Now, if you end up siding with Lily earlier, she will end up helping you during this fight. But obviously, if you don't, then you have to do it all on your own. But either way, you do eventually get the upper hand on Andy and are given the choice of whether or not to beat him up, 
which has similar ramifications to the previous Danny choice, though this is done in front of the entire group. But following this, we get another extremely notable scene to me, and probably only to me, where I just love this moment of Andy yelling to Lee to come back to fight with him, and this really over-the-top acting of Andy's here being really notable to me, and I've always found this to be a pretty fitting scene to conclude this conflict, where again, you have the choice of killing or sparing Andy here. Killing him does obviously scare Clementine, here we will end up pushing him to the fence, which ends up killing him, which I do think that is a fitting death scene for him. Though I do think sparing him does fit in line with Lee's character, and it also allows him to keep his relationship with Clementine the same. Though either way, the farm eventually gets overrun by walkers, leading to his probable death anyway. But then we end the episode with the return to the motel, where during the walk, we have a conversation with Kenny over the decision with Larry, where if you side with him, he tells you that he plans on still going for the coast and wants you to come along with him. While otherwise, he obviously tells you to stay out of his way. Also, we have a convo with Clementine that shows Clem's role as Lee's moral compass, where we end up having to talk through our decisions at the farm with her. But then the group ends up finding an abandoned car, which is filled with food and supplies, obviously being the end of the group's issues here, but at the same time would be taking this away from some stranger that we might come to know later on. And I do like how this is a pretty unassuming decision to make here, where it doesn't seem like this is going to play much of a factor on the story moving forward. Though obviously we get the major revelation in the final episode that it is an important decision. But either way, the group ends up stealing the supplies, though Clementine ends up being against the idea. And obviously we have to make the choice of whether or not to agree with it as well. Which finally to me decides whether or not Clementine gets a new hoodie or not, which just seems like a random consequence of all of this. And... It does feel like the intention of the developers was for you to take the supplies, as otherwise I don't think the final confrontation holds as much weight. But either way, the episode will finally conclude with Doug slash Carly finding batteries in the car and gives them to Lee to power the camcorder that Lee found at Jolene's camp, leading to us finding out that she was watching us the entire time and ends up warning us that humans are the real enemies, not walkers, and ends up warning us of the bandits, which obviously plays into episode 3 and is an ominous conclusion to this episode, but one that doesn't really hold as much weight as other cliffhangers in this season for me. But with that, let's talk about episode 3, Long Road Ahead, which is an episode that I adored when I first played it, with having a bevy of shocking events within it, and it probably being the episode that progresses the plot the most, but I do think in retrospect, it's probably my least favorite episode of the season at this point, where while it does have these fantastic individual moments, the overall episode does feel very monotonous, with a decent amount of sections throughout it that kind of bore me, and some tedious gameplay along with that. Now, episode 3 does start once again after another time skip, the final true time skip of this season, this time being three weeks later and starting with us seeing Lee and Kenny having to return to the town of Macon in search of supplies. Having already run low on what they stole from the abandoned car, leading to them running into the drugstore for one last trip for its supplies. But here we do instantly have a conversation with Kenny where he reiterates his plan of going to the coast, which starts to come to fruition in this episode. But we do also get our first puzzle section of us having Kenny climb a ladder to go over a truck, only for that ladder to break, leading to Lee having to find his own way up, which does require the use of a winch on a military jeep that we use to move the jeep closer to the truck that we can use as a base to use as Kenny pulls us up. But along the way, we do have more discussions with Kenny, including talking about Lily. That obviously changes based on whether or not you side with him in the last episode. We also hear from Kenny that Duck has recently talked about Sean's death, showing Kenny still having guilt over Sean's death, which plays a factor into his psyche moving forward. But before climbing onto the truck, the two end up hearing a woman screaming, turning out that she is being chased by a group of walkers, but is clearly already bit, giving us the first true decision of the episode of whether or not to shoot her. Shooting her ironically being the moral decision here as it would spare her from her suffering with her otherwise being eaten alive, though through doing so it does leave you without a distraction, meaning that you have less time to get supplies. But keeping her alive will give you that distraction, but will also make her suffer a slow and gruesome death. So, while this is a mostly insignificant choice by the end of it, it does end up being a pretty nuanced here that again does slightly affect your relationship with Kenny and also can change how the remaining group looks at you. But then we enter the drugstore, which does end up being this intense set piece where gameplay wise, we do start off with a dumb section of picking up all the supplies and the limited amount of time that we have. 
with there not being enough time to pick up everything if you did end up shooting the woman, though otherwise you should have plenty of time to end up picking up everything. But again, none of this truly matters, as you never put these supplies to any use. But then we get the escape, which ends up being this big action section where the walkers attack the store, and a door collapses on Lee, where depending on your relationship with Kenny, he either goes back to help you, or he hesitates, considering leaving on his own with the supplies, though outside of that, this section plays out as your typical action scene, with you still being able to eventually get your way out unscathed. But then we return to the motel where we do see Lee and Kenny brief Lily into what happened during their supply run, during which we see the continuation of the Kenny-Lily feud, with Kenny being upset that they left Ben on watch, and him sarcastically thanking her for asking if they were fine, but based on the amount of supplies we were able to get, Lily will respond differently about the amount of new rations, but that's really the only significance of that previous choice with the bitten woman, as either way we do get an argument between Kenny and Lily, over Kenny wanting to leave in the RV, while Lily is against the idea. But this fight really does erupt here, especially after Lily mentions the fact that someone has been stealing medical supplies, and she orders everyone out of her room, giving this awkward tone around the motel moving forward, with the group clearly being fractured. But at this point, Lee ends up having a conversation with Carly, if she's still alive, where she tells Lee that this might be a good time to tell the remaining group about his past, in order to build trust back with the group, and also to stop Lily from potentially blowing up his spot. Which this conversation doesn't exist if Doug is alive, as it wouldn't make any sense for this conversation to happen. And Lee and Carly can also have a bit of a flirtatious relationship at this point as well that really makes it feel as if the developers intended on you keeping Carly alive at this point as again the Doug route just feels less impactful and just straight up has less content. So through that obviously at this point if you want you can go to the others and tell them about Lee's past and in doing so can secure his relationships with Kenny and Ben moving forward. Well here we also have to eventually return to Lily's room where she will elaborate on the missing supplies revealing that she has been keeping her own count that shows that their count has been off and shows him a broken flashlight that she found as evidence that someone was using it when they weren't supposed to. So we are now tasked with finding out who the traitor is, leading to an investigation section where we have to piece everything together, but immediately after leaving Lily's room, we do see that Duck has been eavesdropping on the conversation, leading to Duck joining our investigation, whether you want him to or not. And really, this is the most screen time Duck himself gets by himself, where most of the time he is just there to give either a dumb one-liner or is there in connection to Kenny or Katja, but here he finally gets to do something on his own that can make him come off as annoying, but also kind of endearing at the same time. But the investigation does lead to Lee finding the broken glass shards from the flashlight in the back corner of the motel, where he also sees a chalk marked X on the wall, leading to Lee going to Clementine, asking her where her pink chalk has gone, to where she reveals that it's been missing, only for Duck to actually be of use here, where he ends up finding chalk beneath the dumpsters that they've been using as gates, leading to Lee finding a grate outside the walls that contain a bag of medicine that ends up confirming Lily's theory. Leading to us reporting back to Lily, though before we can do anything about it, we end up seeing a group of bandits having infiltrated the motel, holding the group hostage for not getting their drug shipment, leading to Lily taking the first shot, causing our group to scramble as we prepare to escape from the motel, while the bandits show up and we get this pretty tedious sniper section where we have to shoot them down before they reach the members of our group, and I always found this section really annoying to play, especially considering the amount of lag that there is with the rifle, but after the bandits dissipate, walkers start to overrun the motel as well, leading to Katja and Duck being attacked by one, which we later find out is where Duck ends up getting bitten. But despite that, Kenny is able to get the RV running, and we are able to escape, though now having the group on the run after having just lost their home and all their supplies, which really perpetuates the dire tone of this episode. Which doesn't stop there, as Lily continues to go on a rampage here, still trying to figure out which one of the group was dealing with the bandits, as from her point of view, she believes that this is what caused the attack to begin with. Where from my point of view, I feel like the person doing it was trying to save the group, as the bandits would have attacked them earlier if that had not been the case, but whatever. But interestingly here, Lily's main suspect ends up being Carly if she survived, though it ends up being Ben if she doesn't. And despite them denying Having any involvement in this, Lily refuses to accept any response or feedback here, leading to this massive argument aboard the RV until Kenny ends up accidentally crashing into a walker and Lily orders everyone outside. 
where we get one of the tensest scenes in the game and what is one of the most shocking scenes in the entire game, where again the argument continues outside with Lily now threatening to kick Ben out of the group and with Carly alive you can see her getting increasingly more frustrated in the situation. Lee can voice his opinion here and even claim that he was the one to steal supplies but Lily just ignores him no matter what. Ben gets more frantic making Lily trust him even less, leading to Doug slash Carly coming to his defense and calls for her to stop threatening him and if Carly is still alive she really scolds Lily here calling her a scared little girl and when Kenny finally joins the group we hear a gunshot go off with Lily having shot Carly in the face a really shocking death and one that I remember being genuinely sad at the first time I played the game as Carly was probably my favorite character in the game outside of Lee so this ends up being a really shocking death that is one of the most notable moments of the entire series in my eyes really showing you that anyone can die at any moment Though in retrospect, obviously, considering the amount of work it would have taken for Telltale to continue keeping Doug and Carly alive in the game, having the right numerous scenarios for them, it obviously makes sense logistically why they would kill her here. Though the fact that they were able to use that to cause this really shocking death really makes it feel like they took the most out of this opportunity. Now, obviously, if Doug survives at this point, I do find this scene to be a lot less impactful, where Doug doesn't really feel like Doug in this scene, where, again, most of the writing here is similar to that of Carly, making him feel a lot more bold than the meek, nerdy character that we had known for most of his run here, and he ends up dying not because Lily aims for him, but because she aims for Ben, and Doug tries to pull him out of the way, causing him to accidentally take the shot himself, which, again, Again, I didn't find this to be nearly as impactful for me, and it also just feels kind of out of character for Doug to be doing this. Here we are given the decision of what to do with Lily, which is a choice that leads to pretty minor ramifications on the story here, but also ramifications for the final season, which I may talk about at some point, but leaving her behind goes along with what Kenny wants, where we just end up driving away as, as we see Lily through the back window as she notices a walker and ends up running away from it. While if we let her back in, Kenny warns Lee that this is a mistake, which it ends up being, but either way, it does lead to Lily calling out Lee's pass, which obviously if you had told Kenny already, he ends up standing by you, though even if he doesn't, he just ends up being annoyed and it doesn't really play that much of a factor in the story, though obviously it would have made more narrative sense if you did tell him. Now there's, we do get another gut punch, where Katja calls Lee to the front of the RV, where they end up revealing to him that Duck has been bitten. Again, really making it one bad thing after another for the group here, but here we do first see Kenny's delusions of him not being able to accept his son's fate, where he talks about the plan not changing and having hope that maybe someone has found a cure, which obviously wasn't going to happen here, but we do end up telling Clementine this news as well, and again, this conversation with Clementine ends up allowing Lee to unpack the recent events, and ends up being another bonding moment for them, though along the way, Lee ends up having a nightmare of Clementine becoming a walker and attacking him, which does show you how this duck news has affected Lee here, realizing that what happened to Duck could easily happen to Clementine, which does affect the story moving forward. But then the RV gets stopped by a derailed train, leading to everyone getting out, except for Lily if she's still there. But we are tasked with having to figure out how to move the train, which ends up being a really tedious puzzle section in my eyes that also does take up a bulk of the episode here. But we do also notice that someone has made a camp inside of a boxcar, which foreshadows a new addition to the group. But we do find a map to the train route where he will find out that the train conveniently heads to Savannah, a city by the coast, and also the location that Clementine's parents went on vacation to, killing multiple birds with one stone here. But also we end up finding water that we can give to Katja for duck, and also there's like an optional side objective that you can find a car with a walker in it, that through it you can get some food for Duck as well, though realistically doesn't have much of an effect on anything. But to progress the story, you have to enter the cabin where you find a dead body slumped over, and after getting rid of it, you end up disabling the brakes, making you realize that the train is still fully functional. And after getting a notepad that used to have the instructions to the train, we do realize that if you use a pencil, you can see the outline of the instructions. So we go into the RV to grab a pencil, which is where if Lily had been kept around, we end up having our final interaction with her, with her having freed herself and she ends up taking the RV for herself, which obviously leaves us with no other option but to start the train here. And really the train ends up being the main option anyway, as it would be the fastest way to reach the coast in the hopes of finding help for Duck. 
After following the instructions, we do get the train to power on, only for us to try to move it, and it turns out that the train is still attached to its derailed caboose, meaning that we have to get a tool to unlatch the pin, which after doing so, we finally get introduced to the new character here, the vagrant living in the train, that being Chuck, who does come off as a pretty interesting character here, having a forthright personality that also seems pretty insightful at points, and I did find him to be a welcome addition to the group here, though you can start your relationship off on a bad note by lying to him about taking anything from his camp, but realistically, it doesn't matter too, too much. And either way, the group still ends up boarding the train, still unsure of what to do about Duck, with Clem even mentioning Duck's deteriorating condition. But Kenny refuses to do anything about it, though as we do turn on the thruster, we do see Lee and Kenny smile for a moment, with Kenny's smile starting to fade, which makes it clear that even he recognizes the dire situation that they are in. But then we cut to a few hours later, where everyone but Kenny is in the boxcar, where you can bond a bit with Chuck, though eventually Katja calls Lee over to show Duck, now coughing up blood, which Katja wants Lee to use as motivation to get Kenny to stop the train, leading to us going back to the cabin, where Lee has to convince Kenny to do so, but Kenny initially ignores him, and here we get numerous options in how to try to get Kenny to see reason here. From getting aggressive, to calling out Kenny's denial, to calling him selfish, to taking a logical approach and trying to sympathize with him, but really none of this ends up working, leading to Kenny still getting frustrated, and we are given the choice now of either going all in on talking Kenny down or deciding to fight him, where we're talking him down requires Lee to call out Kenny's denial stemming from his failures, with the death of Sean being a notable example of that, that Kenny correlates to the world taking his son away because he helped in the death of someone else's, Though, through this, Lee is able to calmly reassure him and can get Kenny to stop the train without conflict, but most options do end up leading to a fight with Kenny, which if you do side against Kenny for most of the story, I do feel like this is the option that makes the most narrative sense to see them hash out their differences here through this fight, though even this route can lead to numerous different ways that the fight can end and for you to get Kenny back to his senses, but no matter what, he does end up deciding to stop the train here. Leading to another of the most somber scenes here, with Katja now holding an extremely pale duck, and she tells Kenny that they are out of time, and that they can't let duck turn, leading to Kenny clearly being heartbroken, knowing what they have to do, where Kenny volunteers to be the one to shoot duck, but Katja tells him that he can't do it, which makes the following choice very questionable, where Katja walks off into the woods to prepare for duck to be put down, and we have a short conversation conversation with Clem where we can either be blunt to her about Duck's death or lie to her, though I feel like that doesn't feel like as satisfying for their arc, but eventually a gunshot is heard where we run into the woods to find out that Katja had decided to kill herself before having killed Duck, which I will say I think this makes for a pretty unlikable ending for Katja here, where obviously you understand the situation of a grieving mother and the sorrow that comes along with that, but for her to kill herself here does make her come off as selfish, in that she leaves Kenny alone in the position where now he is obviously this broken man, having just lost his entire family in one go here, so I didn't love that outcome for her, though it does propel Kenny's arc moving forward. But with Duck still alive, Kenny asks Lee what he should do, giving us the choice of killing Duck ourselves or having Kenny do it. Now having Kenny kill Duck here does seem particularly cruel to have Kenny have to kill his own son here, and while Lee assures him that everything will be okay, it does end up being an extremely dark scene here, while having Lee kill Duck does again gain in favor with Kenny, and just seems like the more humane thing to do after what Kenny had just been through. But afterwards, the remaining group continues to head towards Savannah, now being a shell of the group of what we had just at the beginning of the episode. Now, if only Lee, Kenny, and Clementine remaining from episode one, we then have Ben, who is Ben, and then we have Chuck, who literally just joined. So this really just feels like a random group of survivors at this point. But Lee ends up talking to Clementine, who is upset after Chuck had warned her that what happened to Duck will happen to her, enraging Lee to where he confronts Chuck, where he says that she will die if they continue to treat her as a little girl, and that Lee should involve her in his decisions, while also saying that we should teach her about how to defend herself, and also randomly cut her hair, as having it long does end up being a vulnerability, but that just seems like a random thing to add there. And what do you know, those are essentially our next set of tasks, though these are kind of annoying to play through, 
Though I do love what it does for Lee and Clementine's relationship, which this sequence really does exemplify the lessons that Clementine learns from her time with Lee to where this scene is a fundamental piece of Clementine's development, especially her development as a character for future installments, with the lessons that she learns in this scene impacting her decision making in future games. But again, the actual process of teaching her here is just kind of annoying, you have the teacher out of the shoot, during which you have to point her in the right direction and that's kind of boring, you have to find scissors that you use to cut Clem's hair, also kind of boring, though oh, again, nice bonding moment between Lee and Clem. But the final piece of this section is creating a plan, which we need a map in order to do so, leading to a really dumb sequence of events of Kenny being unwilling to move from the engine car to allow us to grab the map that he's sitting next to, leading to us having to find a bottle of whiskey that we give to Chuck just for us to tell Kenny about, which is the only thing that's able to lure him away from the chair so we can grab the map again. All this is just really dumb. Before returning to the boss car, we do end up getting stopped by Ben to where he reveals to us that he is the one that was sneaking supplies to the bandits, which the characters in the series obviously have hard feelings against him for doing so. And I feel like a lot of the fan base also seems to hate Ben, partially due to this revelation, which again, for me, I never got the hate where if anything, again, Ben was saving them from the bandits and got them to stop attacking them for as long as they did, and technically his plan was working until Lily and Lee were the ones to ruin it. Like, Ben had good intentions while doing this, so I never personally got the hate for him for this situation, but we finally do end up making a plan with Clementine, where she wants to go to look for her parents no matter what, and Lee ends up agreeing to that part of the plan, and we do figure out that they are staying at a hotel called the Marsh House which might be important later. But immediately after the scene, the train ends up stopping once again, this time being because of a petroleum tanker hanging from a bridge, which ends up blocking the path forward. During which we finally get to see Kenny being frustrated by this, continuing his really bad day. But eventually the group is cut off by the presence of two new characters atop of the bridge, in that being Krista and Omid, two pretty major characters despite them being introduced over halfway into the game, and Clementine instantly takes a liking to them, which foreshadows the ending of the game, with Omid being excited to see a kid around, while Krista instantly picks up on the fact that Lee is not her father, and Clem instantly bonds with her as well, but through doing so, Krista and Omid eventually join our group here, and afterwards we are tasked with checking out the train station on the other side of the bridge to find a way to take down the tanker, during which Clem ends up wanting to go alongside us, which we allow her to do so, and here she does end up helping him by her being the only one that's able to unlock the door, and immediately afterwards we get this dumb section of entering the station but needing a way to get sunlight, which you end up having to use your tool to prop the door open, but for some reason, if you don't, within a certain time limit, the game kicks you out of the room only for you to do it again, which just seems kind of ridiculous, but in this station, we do end up finding a blowtorch that we will use to knock down the tanker, but again, Lee has to lift Clementine through a gap in order to unlock the door, but when doing so, Lee gets attacked by two walkers, leading to a bit of an action sequence here that does have us losing our pistol, though through grabbing his weapon at the door, he is able to kill the two walkers, but when looking at Clementine, we do see her having picked up the gun, but was too scared to shoot, only for a walker to then show up behind her, leading to us having to unlock the gate, and Clem handing the gun back to Lee to where he finally takes the walker down. I mean, this entire sequence does further show the strengths of them as a duo, and does provide some development for Clementine, but immediately following this, we do end up seeing Krista end up entering the station, having heard the gunshots, where she criticizes Lee for taking Clementine into this situation, which ends up showing them having conflicting personalities at this point. But this scene does nicely end with Lee giving Clementine another lesson in Clem saying that she wasn't ready for the gun, but he responds instead by telling her to learn to not be afraid, which seems to be a piece of advice that sticks with Clementine moving forward. And also by the next episode, we see this being fulfilled. But we do end up grabbing the blowtorch and return to the bridge where first we need to find some tape to fix the blowtorch to, which is kind of dumb. And it's also conveniently placed at the back of the ambulance that's also on the bridge, but also ends up being a section that's like, why is this even here to begin with? But also to add to their troubles, Lee himself isn't able to reach far enough to cut the tanker, so he ends up having to dangle Omid over the gap, which concludes the puzzle section here. But when doing so, we have a massive zombie herd heading towards the group, leading to an escape sequence that has Lee and Omid have to jump off the bridge onto the train, which Omid is terrified to do and ends up falling 
off of it, injuring his leg, leading to Krista jumping off of the train to try to help him. And now with them both chasing after the train, we get one final decision for this episode that really doesn't matter, but we have to pick which of the two to help here. And again, this choice doesn't affect much as both get saved anyway, though weirdly, whoever you do end up saving ends up actually being upset at you for saving them and not saving the other person. Krista, because of Omid's injury, and Omid, because of what's implied for a first time here, though, is never explicitly said in that Krista is pregnant. But again, no matter what, they both end up surviving here. And we do end the episode with a pretty great revelation, where the next morning, Lee is driving the train as it nears Savannah, with Clementine sleeping next to him, but out of the blue, Clem's walkie-talkie, which was assumed to be broken since the events of episode 1, now appears to be working, and we hear a stranger's voice coming through it telling Clementine that he's happy she's coming to Savannah and that he's with her parents, clearly using the walkie-talkie here to manipulate Clementine, leading to his great mystery of who this mysterious voice is. But then we get to episode four, Around Every Corner, which to me ends up being another episode, kind of like episode two of it telling a great independent story here, with it focusing around the group's arrival in Savannah and having to deal with Crawford, which are great storylines on their own, but I do feel like this episode also connects to the grander narrative better than episode two. That does prop the episode up a bit as one of my personal favorites, considering how well it perfectly sets up the final episode, though I do feel like there are some sections that go on for a bit long that probably do knock it down a smidge from episode two as well. But we do start episode four a few hours after the events of the previous episode as the group walks through the streets of Savannah, where we do see Lee holding on to Clem's walkie-talkie due to finding out that she's been talking to the stranger, though this does end up causing Clem to be annoyed with him as she pleads for it back. Now also, Omid struggles to keep up with the group due to his injuries, leading to us having the choice of helping him or pressing on, though again, it doesn't really matter much. But eventually, as we near the church, the bells from it start to ring, and we notice a figure running across the rooftop and this leads to the stranger speaking on the walkie-talkie, warning the group that they have to move, making it seem like he is connected to the bell ringing, adding to the mystery of who this person is, though obviously the two events end up being unconnected. But this does lead to another action sequence where walkers start attacking the group, where instantly Kenny gets tripped up and we end up having to save him, but then we see Clementine and Ben being cornered by a group of zombies, and Ben shows how feckless he is by abandoning Clem, leading to a first-person shooter section that has us shooting down zombies on our way to Clem here, which I've always really hated. Considering the aiming is really janky here, but Chuck ends up saving her anyway, and decides to stay to fight off the other walkers, telling the group that he'll meet up with them later, which he sadly never does. So he does end up getting this heroic sacrifice here that does feel very abrupt, especially considering we only met him like halfway through the last episode and for him to instantly get separated from the group here is disappointing considering how integral of a character he was in getting Lee to prepare Clem for the apocalypse. That just feels like he was used more so as a plot device in order to spring that on than an actual intended interesting character here. But this does lead to the group fleeing to the backyard of a mansion, leading to our first explore area of the episode where we have to find our way into the mansion, which we find out is probably through the doggy door, which is electronically locked, meaning that we have to find the animal collar to open it, leading to this pretty depressing scene of us finding the dog's grave and having to dig it up, where we find the dog decomposed, and we can tell Clem to stay away, which will end up hurting our feelings, but even if you don't, Krista pulls her away anyway, and we do end up having to take the collar off of the dog, which is a morbid scene as the dog's head rolls off its body, and we see Krista vomiting, which is supposed to be foreshadowing to her pregnancy, though I feel like it's also just kind of weird timing as really any normal person could also puke in this situation. But with the collar, we're able to open the doggy door, but none of the adults can fit through it, so unpromptedly, Clementine crawls through and unlocks it, again, furthering her development of her now not being scared to do situations like this. Though Lee can respond to this in varying ways from worry to anger to praise with obviously praise seeming like the best option here. But once inside, we do get some speculation over the identity of the stranger, while also Krista gets upset for not being told about the situation beforehand, though it all leads to nothing, which really is a complaint for me in terms of how Krista and Omid's relationship is handled in this game where most of their choices don't end up mattering. 
but the gameplay here does involve us checking the entirety of the house for any walkers or traps, which is deemed to be clear of, but eventually we do learn that Kenny has found something in the attic, in that being a frail walker boy that conveniently looks just like Duck, adding a depressing context to this house where the boy had clearly starved to his death here, but then we get the decision on how to put the boy down, which ends up being a similar choice to that of what we had to do with Duck, where Lee can kill the boy himself, which is the more neutral option here, you can convince Kenny to kill the boy, which unlike the duck situation, this choice actually ends up booning your relationship with Kenny, which to be honest, I never fully understood why. But also you can just leave the room in which Krista will end up killing the boy instead, which is a more negative option here that ends up angering Krista, but also negatively impacts your relationship with Kenny. But no matter what, this does lead to Lee being the one to bury the child next to his dog being this really somber moment, but this does lead to us seeing someone watching us from beyond the gate, though they end up running off before we can see who it is, though through that it is pretty clear that that was the stranger watching over the group. But then the group regathers to where Kenny redeclares his plan to find the boat, leading to him and Lee going off to the harbor to look for one, which when they arrive, they obviously find the area void of boats, except for one sunk halfway into the water, and in Kenny's typical delusion, he tries to salvage it. But while he is doing so, we are tasked with using the telescope to check out the other side of the river to see if there's any more boats, but we find out that the telescope needs a quarter to activate it, giving us this open area of this empty street that we can explore where we find a barrier made up of zombified bodies with live walkers being impaled on spikes that ends up being this really ominous setup towards Crawford, the antagonistic group for this episode. But eventually we do find a newspaper stand that we get to spit out a quarter and we use it to look through the telescope, revealing nothing of use until we see a shadowy figure on top of a building climbing down to the street where we initially watch the figure until Kenny creates a plan to ambush them. But when Lee tries to sneak up on them, we find out they have disappeared, reappearing behind him, starting a fight sequence between the two where no matter how this fight plays out, Clementine ends up showing up, having somehow snuck away from the mansion, but if you do the fight properly and overpower them, Clementine's appearance ends up distracting Lee instead, while if you fail the fight, Clementine's appearance is more impactful where just as the assailant goes for the final strike, Clementine appears causing them to stand down, leading to the assailant removing their face covering to reveal that they aren't the stranger from the walkie-talkie, but instead a new character in Molly. Though before she can formally introduce herself, Kenny, not getting the memo, still attempts to sneak up on her, and she ends up tripping him, causing him to drop his gun to where it accidentally shoots as it hits the ground, which will eventually lead a group of walkers to their location. But first we do have to meet Molly here, who gets a great introduction here, that while she does come off as this like generic loner type, she is shown to be exceptionally skilled with abilities that can help the group, but also shows a fondness to Clementine along the way. But also here we get this fantastic intro to Crawford, where we learn that it is the supposed utopia, where all the well-bodied people from Savannah are now living, though also we find out that it has become this authoritarian society that has adopted this survival of the fittest philosophy, where they exile children, elderly and disabled people, to where instantly this makes it come off as a dystopia. It also shows why she now trusts our group as Clementine wouldn't be allowed in Crawford, meaning that we're not a part of them. And again, this really sets up Crawford as this major antagonistic force here that we'll have the face off against, which I do like how this episode ends up subverting your expectations when we learn the reality of the situation. But eventually the walkers end up interrupting our talk and we get another action sequence as we try to escape from them, only for Molly to end up escaping on her own by making her way up a fire escape that we can't reach. And while she contemplates leaving us there, it is again Clementine that changes her mind, once again her being used as a plot device to appeal to strangers. But after Kenny and Clementine are pulled up, Lee ends up getting stuck in the alleyway, but Lee ends up finding a manhole, which Molly throws him for climbing pick, to which Lee ends up using it to pry open the sewer entrance and make his escape leaving Lee on his own for the next little bit as he has to navigate the sewers, which is a pretty boring stretch gameplay wise, where we do find a group of walkers and have a short puzzle section of trying to distract them by turning on the water on one side and sneaking to the tunnel to pass by them. But once reaching their former location, we do find out that they have been eating away at Chuck's remains with him having empty gun nearby, implying that he had taken his own life right before the walkers caught up to him. A really somber way for his character to go here, but then we get another action section where a walker ends up reaching out for Lee's leg, 
And if he kills it silently here, he goes through the rest of the section undetected, though if you end up using a gun here, it causes the distracted walkers to head back towards him, giving us a time limit and us reaching the exit. Though while failing to reach it, we instead end up finding a secret entrance into the back room of what would later turn out to be a morgue, though through this we do end up encountering a small group that resides here, who instantly assume that Lee is from Crawford, and through that, now think that they are in danger, leading to an interrogation section, where if Lee says that the wrong things, like threatening the group here, it can lead to him being killed, to which you have to obviously replay the section again, but here we do get introduced to the two important characters of this group, that being Vernon, the leader of the group, and Bree, who's initially hostile towards Lee here, though later in the episode they do end up being tentative allies for him, but here we do find a way to disarm Vernon, which will either be by doing it in a calm, slow manner, or by doing it by force, but either way we do eventually learn that this group has been exiled from Crawford as a group of cancer survivors who are no longer deemed fit to be within that society, but no matter what, when we leave to return to the mansion, Vernon ends up going with us. But again, the context behind why can be radically different here. You can talk about your bond with Clementine, which will obviously humanize you to the group and will allow you to bring him along without lying, which will make Vernon go peacefully without any ill will. Lying to him will cause him to get upset once he gets there, or you could just straight up force him to at which you completely burn your relationship with him, though either way, Vernon still ends up being kind of a dick to you by the end of the story anyway, so again, doesn't really matter. But immediately after returning to the mansion, we do find Molly sifting through the mansion for supplies, with her still coming off as a self-interested figure here, though we do end up returning her pick to her and welcome her to stay at the mansion, making her a temporary member of our group here. Also, while Vernon is here, him being a doctor, he ends up working on Omid's injured leg, all while we notice that Clementine has gone missing again, really making Krista and Ben come off as incompetent here and watching over, and really makes it a questionable choice that Krista and Omid are the ones to take care of Clementine after this, but... Along the way, we do end up finding a drunk Kenny who tells us how hopeless the situation is, but eventually we do go to the backyard to look for her, only to hear a knock in the shed, and when we open the doors, we do find Clementine inside, conveniently alongside a boat. Furthering the boat storyline and rejuvenating Kenny as he once again regains hope after seeing it. Now, some time passes and we do see Lee pacing around the living room until we eventually get a rundown on the current situation. But along the way, Vernon ends up finishing his work on Omid, but Omid still ends up being bedridden. We do learn from Molly that she now plans on getting on the boat along with the group as she feels that she is owed for saving Lee's life. But eventually, Kenny ends up returning after checking on the boat, revealing that the boat is in good condition but does need a battery and some gas. And with the group talking about Crawford being the only location in the city that would have those things, this does set up the rest of the episode, where the group now needs to infiltrate Crawford, this ominous community that has been really set up as this antagonistic force beforehand, to where we are essentially going to be having a heist mission, taking on this group in what is a perfect way for this narrative to move forward here. We're now aligning with Vernon, who knows the area well. He ends up creating a plan to sneak through the sewers in order to get in, in exchange for agreeing to help him get medicine along the way, really adding to this ragtag bunch of misfits trope that this mission exudes, but ends up adding to the scale of the mission as a whole. But after the initial planning stage here, we do end up finding Clementine listening to the group's plans, and we do get to talk to her about the dangers that this heist mission can bring, leading to her stating that she needs to get ready, mentioning that she wants to go flee to find her parents, who she assumes are in Crawford, leading to another decision of ours where we get to decide on whether or not to take Clementine with us, which for me, while taking her to Crawford puts her in a lot of danger and earns you the scrutiny of the stranger later on, I do feel like from a narrative perspective, the story is a lot more impactful if you do take her with you, showing the development in Lee and Clementine's relationship to where he ends up trusting her here, and also a scene in Crawford ends up further developing her character as well. Also, I do straight up feel bad for Clementine in the scenario where you leave her behind, where she's like walking away dejected, so probably that plays a factor into why I like the option of taking her a bit more as well, but afterwards the group gathers in the backyard where Kenny offers the group tools from the shed and also ends up pulling Lee off to the side where he informs us that the boat will not be big enough for all of them and that we will need to make some decisions down the road on who exactly to take. Which is interesting that the game sets up this major decision for down the road, a major decision that never ends up actually happening. 
But then Vernon returns from informing his group about the plan, leading to Bree joining our expedition here as well, with her knowing where Crawford had kept their supplies, which essentially leads to her just being an excuse for the characters to know where they're going once inside Crawford. But here before leaving, if Lee has decided to not take Clem, he will task her of protecting Omid, but also can hand her a pistol for her to defend herself, and also tells her to hide in the case of any danger, which all this does also progress their relationship, but again, to me, not in as satisfying of a way as it would if you just decide to take her along with you. Though there is an option of you not giving her a weapon at all, which at that point, it really makes all of this a disappointing route to take. Though here, the decision to take Clem with them will cause Vernon to be upset at Lee for that decision. That does potentially set up future events with Vernon better than if you don't. But then the group leaves for Crawford, where after exiting the sewer, we do see a man standing guard and try to sneak up on him, only for it to be revealed that he is a walker. A great reveal to see the current state of Crawford here, the supposed utopia that we now see having ended up crumbling due to the walkers and ends up radically changing the mission here. With the community now being filled with walkers instead of humans, who would have been a lot more difficult to deal with, essentially minimizing the threat level of the mission at this point, though we still end up having to escape to a school, that ends up conveniently being the place that they used as a storehouse. But from there, we are able to find a classroom labeled as the control room, which contains a locked door that leads into the armory, which initially Ben ends up working on on his own. And we do have the team split up into pairs of two to get each of the desired supplies here. Kenny and Bree go to get gas, Krista and Vernon go to get the medicine, while Lee and Molly go to get the battery. And if Clementine is brought, she essentially ends up being paired up with Ben, with her being left in the control room. Which initially disappoints her, but you can assure her that Ben is being left with her instead of the other way around, which that makes her happy. But also here we do have a conversation with Ben, where Ben mentions wanting to tell Kenny his involvement with the bandits, which does seem very convenient that he wants to do this now in the middle of this high stress situation, but this does obviously end up being foreshadowing for future events. But Lee and Molly have to make their way to the auto shop to get the car battery, during which Molly runs off on her own, as you would expect her to, leaving us to having to find our own way there, which leads to a mostly boring stretch of having to walk through the empty school and then walking through the back entrance and climbing over a shed to get to the auto shop. And once we're there, we find the door jammed anyway, weirdly leaving us without anything we can really do until eventually a walker drops from the rooftop, followed by Molly showing up to hack away at the walker, being clear that she has a personal vendetta against it. Though obviously Molly denies these claims, though I did like this foreshadowing to Molly's connection to Crawford, that becomes more apparent later, but then Molly ends up helping us enter the auto shop conveniently right before a group of walkers catch up to us. And at this point, we do end up exploring the auto shop, obviously searching for a battery, which ends up being in a lifted up car, to which we end up having to cut down the hydraulic tube with Molly's pick. But in doing so, the car's alarm ends up going off, leading to another action sequence with the walkers breaking in, and we have to grab the battery quickly and climb to the rooftop. And after we get another one of the more annoying gameplay sections in the original release where Lee and Molly have to jump back to the rooftop of the school and the jump itself all comes down to a couple seconds where you have to grab Molly's hand which wasn't the easiest thing to do on the original release with the really laggy controls but again it's gotten better in future releases but this does lead to Lee returning to the main section of the school only for Molly to run off on her own again saying she needs to run an errand while also taking the battery with her to make sure we don't leave without her which again really sets up this mystery of Molly's background and her obviously having this blatant connection to Crawford and questioning why she's going off on her own now as Lee walks back towards the classroom Kenny and Bree end up returning at the same time though with walkers following them leading to Lee using a hatchet to block the door now here you you can also stop down to talk to the supporting cast, but eventually the main story takes you to helping Vernon and Krista as they suck and for some reason can't get the medicine on their own. And actually, if you check up on them before Kenny and Bree arrive, they're still outside of the nurse's office, still trying to get in, which is pathetic. But after that scene, once you check up on them, they are now inside, but a group of walkers have now surrounded the door, leading to another FPS section that sucks but once finding our way in we do find them struggling to open the safe where the medical supplies are being kept obviously leading to us doing all the work for them where through some investigations we do end up finding a tape and a camcorder and through watching the footage we do get 
to see the visits of a pregnant woman named Anna Correa, which tries to fight back against Crawford's policies with her now being deemed a liability due to her pregnancy. And through watching this video, you do recognize the doctor as the walker that Molly was hacking on earlier, furthering Molly's connection to Crawford here, but also leading to us having to retread our steps and going back to the auto shop to find the body and hopefully finding a combination there. And that's just all really tedious. And along the way, they do add a walker attack in the shed that again is also just kind of annoying with this entire section just feeling very monotonous but on his body we do end up finding a locker combination along with a second tape that while watching this tape we do end up seeing the doctor put in the combination giving us the code that we need but also interestingly here the video does show anna correa as the one to kill the doctor and we see her proceed to steal the gun killing guards on her way out presumably starting the downfall of crawford which I do like being able to see the why on how this community crumbled. This community that had been so strict on their rules to the point where they crossed moral lines under the name of keeping themselves safe, leading to their own downfall with Anna Correa setting off this chain due to being exiled from their group, which again ends up being a really satisfying downfall for this society. But through this, we do get the medical supplies and end up seeing Krista have a big reaction to the tape, which obviously continues the foreshadowing to her being pregnant. But if you want to, you can also end up opening the doctor's locker, to which you end up finding a third tape, this one being of Molly, which is interesting that they left this as side content, but obviously this ends up explaining Molly's resentment towards the doctor, with it turning out that she was sleeping with him to get medicine for her diabetic sister, which he ends up ending their arrangement due to Crawford's strict rules, leading to the death of Molly's sister, which ends up being an interesting backstory for Molly here. But conveniently, as we head back to the classroom, Molly returns through the hole in the roof, revealing that she had left to obtain a photo of her sister. But then we end up running into Ben, who is searching for a way to open the door to the armory and ends up showing them the hatchet that he found, which they promptly figure out was the hatchet blocking the door. And what do you know? Walkers start to barge through the door, showing Ben as pretty incompetent here, but does lead to another action sequence where we do see Molly holding her own until a walker grabs a hold of her and Lee now has to shoot the walker down to save her. If you do shoot the walker, Molly obviously ends up being saved. While obviously if you don't shoot it in time or end up accidentally shooting Molly herself, this ends up being the farewell to her within the story with her having to run off defenseless, which has always been an underwhelming farewell to the character from my point of view. But something cool here is that if you do end up taking Clementine along with you, Molly ends up being saved by her instead, providing a great moment for Clementine's character being the first time she uses a firearm here and putting it to good use. But once we do get back to the classroom, we do have Kenny finally opening the door to the armory and conveniently this is when Ben decides that this is the right time to come clean to Kenny, where he tells him about his dealings with the bandits and this all just feels really dumb that he is choosing this moment of all moments to tell him, again, when the walkers are literally closing in on them and when Kenny had just opened the door, meaning that they have a route out. Again, I get this concept of Ben wanting to do this in the case that they're going to die, but Kenny just decreased the chances of that. So again, I just find this all really ridiculous, but obviously Kenny ends up being upset, looking at Ben as the one that killed his family, which again, I already talked about. Don't think that's true, but that's the context the story wants you to believe in. But this does end up ridiculously leading to a vote within the group of whether or not to kick Ben out. And again, with the walkers right outside the door, this just seems ridiculous. But Clem does end up getting a solid moment here in defending Ben if she is brought along. But eventually through the scene, Bree, who had been defending the door, ends up being attacked by a walker with it biting her. And we see Vernon watch in horror as she dies but this causes the group to start to run into the armory which is located within the bell tower though we do find it already being infested by walkers and we do get another shooter section which i really don't love this one though it doesn't end up being slightly different than previous ones where initially lee has his foot stuck in the broken board and you have to pull it out but also you have walkers approaching you so you have to shoot down the walkers with your shotgun while also trying to get your foot out meaning that you have to micromanage your time here which again to me comes off as pretty tedious but eventually we do end up finding our way to the top of the bell tower where the group ends up escaping though interestingly as vernon opens the window he does clearly notice something in the distance that leads him asking if the group came in on train clearly foreshadowing the massive herd that had been following the group in the previous episode has now arrived in savannah 
and also furthers Vernon's motivations for his actions in the next episode, but the final two left in the tower end up being Lee and Ben, with Ben getting grabbed by a walker, connected to Bell, who ends up being Crawford himself, which is a cool little detail, but after shooting Crawford, we are obviously given the choice here of essentially whether or not to save Ben, and this is a choice that is pretty easy to me, especially narratively, where I do feel like it seems out of character for Lee to just let Ben go here. And also letting him go leads to a more brutal death for Ben with him surviving the fall but ends up being eaten alive, which he had previously claimed is his biggest fear. While pulling him up here ends up leading to him being confused over why you saved him, but also grateful at the same time. And I do feel like it leads to a pretty satisfying role for Ben to play in episode 5, which ends up being a better outcome for him in the story. And also boons the story of Kenny as well to where, again, to me, that's just the better option where if he dies here, it's just kind of anticlimactic. But afterwards, the group does return to the mansion where we do find a motionless Omid leading to a dumb fake out where you think he's dead, but obviously he's not. Now, if Clementine was left at the house, you'll also find a dead walker when you walk in if you had given her a weapon, which again, also kind of a satisfying aspect of her arc, though you don't get directly get to see it, which is why I do think taking her to Crawford is the better option for me. But if you don't end up handing her a weapon at all, she just locks one in a closet, which is just not as interesting. Then we do get Vernon wanting to talk to you where he will either praise or scold you based on your interactions with him and the choices you made across the episode. But bizarrely, this leads to Vernon offering to take Clementine off his hands for him to raise her with the sewer people. And I just found this to be super forced just to have Vernon be this red herring of who took Clementine, especially if he praises Lee. It's like, why would he want to take Clem away from this person that he looks at as a good guy? Like, it really doesn't make any sense. But his interaction can be handled politely or angrily based on your choices here. Now, if Molly does survive, she does also end up leaving the group here, which I do find to be a weird narrative choice after her declaring that she wanted a position on the boat, though I do feel like her role in the story was pretty well concluded in this singular episode, but I would not have been opposed to seeing her actually join the group, but with the type of character that Molly is, it isn't that big surprise that she goes off on her own, though realistically all of this just feels like it was done because they wanted to save money and not have to write her in and out of the final episode. But then we get to the more important conversation of this scene, and that being one with Clementine, who starts to question Lee over if they can go search for her parents, now in the hopes that they weren't in Crawford, and while you can lie or tell her the truth here, that in reality you're not going to, it will still lead to Clementine knowing the situation and crying herself to sleep, obviously this being a low point for their relationship, and we follow this up with Lee falling asleep, only to be awakened to find that Clementine has gone missing. Now we obviously end up searching for her, being unable to find her, heading into the backyard where we do see an abandoned hat on the ground, obviously indicating that she has now been kidnapped, setting up the rescue mission that ends up comprising of the entirety of the final episode, but then they have to up the stakes, where we end up seeing a walkie-talkie next to a pile of trash, obviously leading to us picking it up, where out of the blue, a walker emerges from the pile, attacking Lee, and afterwards, we get the big reveal that Lee was bitten. Which, I remember being traumatized by this when I was younger. I mean, I really grew to love Lee as a character, and this game obviously makes you feel invested in this Lee and Clementine relationship, with us getting to see the foundations of their bond, and seeing it grow through all these dark situations that they are put through, and now seeing that Lee has bit, essentially guaranteeing the end of their relationship, and that Clementine will be alone even if you succeed in your goal here, is a really depressing way, but also a perfect way to end the story here, having this final episode being dedicated to rescuing her with the increased stakes of Lee's impending death, and also showing Lee's dedication towards Clementine with him using his last moments to get her back, which narratively and thematically perfectly wrap up the narrative here despite the somber tone that it brings to the final episode, and also providing this really sad outcome for Lee's character here. But instantly after Lee was bitten, we do see the group going outside in search of him, and here we do get a moment that feels like the culmination of all the choices we've made up until this point, where the group of Kenny, Krista, Omid, and Ben, if he's still alive, are told about Clementine being kidnapped, and based on the current status of your relationships with them, they can decide to go with you to help you rescue her. Now along the way, we do get the choice of revealing or hiding the bite, which is something that I do find a bit disappointing about this outcome, in that this singular choice almost solely determines whether or not Omid and Krista go along with you, as if you do reveal it, they're guaranteed to go with you, while if you don't reveal it, they only go with you if 
Clementine had protected Omid, which is just kind of underwhelming and really makes a lot of the choices that you've made with Krista and Omid really pointless there. And really the overall choice of revealing or hiding your bite also is just kind of irrelevant too, considering no matter what, they're going to figure out about it by the next episode anyway. Now Ben is alive. He almost always goes with you, though you can't actually refuse his help, which is humorous. And then we obviously have Kenny, whose involvement is the most complex here, obviously stemming from all the decisions you've made across the four episodes with him. This ends up being one of the greater ramifications for your previous choices in the game, with Kenny being the one that's the hardest to get to go along with you. But once we get our group together, they end up heading out to the morgue, thinking that Vernon was the one that stole Clementine, and bizarrely, we do find the morgue abandoned. Ozzy playing into this revelation that we get once we get back to the house next episode. But also here, we do end up seeing the morgue now being surrounded by a horde of walkers, the horde alluded to by Vernon, and the same horde that was following us in episode 3, which further adds stakes to this final episode, with Savannah now being fully engulfed by walkers. But without any guide on where to go, we then hear the walkie-talkie turn on, with Clementine calling out for Lee, but then the stranger gets back on the walkie-talkie, confirming that it wasn't Vernon who took Clementine. But the stranger ends up telling Lee that he should choose his next words wisely, and after making the choice of what to say to him, we cut to black. A really riveting way to end this episode that really has the stakes as high as they possibly can be for Lee here, and also providing a pretty cool transition into the following episode. And with that, let's finally talk about the final episode, episode 5, No Time left which to me is an all-time great telltale episode here obviously culminating lee's storyline and his relationship with clementine though while i do absolutely adore this episode in retrospect it is a relatively short one and one that is mostly streamlined with it having almost no real explorable areas and there being just a bevy of action sequences that i do think that aspect of it can be a bit underwhelming though it also does contain some of the best moments in any telltale game that does prop it up for me to it having one of the best endings to any video game ever in my eyes. But the actual episode does pick up right where the last episode left off, as we do hear Lee's conversation with the stranger once again, but this time with shots of the Horde in the background to really set up the stage of what the group is going to have to face here. But finally we get to hear the response that we picked for Lee here from the previous episode, which is a nice touch. But either way, we do end up having to explore the morgue to find a way out through which we find out that we're going to have to open the elevator door, which we do so through finding a rib spreader that allows us to do so. Though, something I do find really dumb here is that if you do come along with your allies, shouldn't they be the ones doing this instead of you, considering you're in this weakened state where you had just been bitten? Either way, as we use the tool on the elevator, Lee ends up passing out, and what happens next is determined on whether or not people come with you. As if you are alone, then obviously you'll wake up, from the floor where you will have to find a surgical saw yourself but if you came with someone you'll awaken to see them preparing to cut your arm off either way you are given the choice of cutting lee's arm off or leaving it which at the end of the day doesn't play much of a factor as either way lee is animated in a way that he rarely uses that other arm and it really doesn't end up playing much of an impact on the plot but it does end up being a pretty brutal scene of lee cutting off his arm especially if he has to do it himself that's really gruesome but either way he ends up screaming out in pain and, and again not a pleasant scene to watch but again, do find it funny that if you only have Ben along with you, Lily still decides to do it by himself instead of making Ben do it. But regardless, we do have the group escaping up the elevator shaft to the roof, which ends up being a slow crawl up the ladder. But along the way, we do get the opening credits during this and more shots of walkers having overrun the hospital. But eventually, we do reach the rooftop where we get a small explorable area that we get to talk to the group that came with us about why they made that decision but eventually we decide to use the strategy we saw molly use in the previous episode of ringing the bells to distract the walkers but to reach the bell tower we need to find a ladder that we will use to cross it and no matter what here even if lee is with the group he is the one that decides to cross the ladder considering he is the one that has the least to lose at this point and conveniently the ladder ends up falling off right at the end where lee barely survives that and then has to make a big jump on the way back which ends up being a pretty similar gameplay section to that of previous jumps, but it does allow us to escape here. After returning to the mansion, which the arrival here is different based on who went with you to the hospital, where either way, we do end up finding out that the boat has been stolen by Vernon's group, but the context behind it is different here, where if people stayed behind, you find them being locked inside the shed, having been insulted by 
Vernon's group. Well, if everyone went with you, they stupidly just leave a note behind, which, again, why? But again, Vernon ends up stealing the boat here. That does obviously leave his character on a much more sour note, but one that obviously does make sense when you realize his disappearance from the morgue, and also his realization at seeing how screwed the city is at the moment that he sees all those walkers entering Savannah during the previous episode. So at least there was some foreshadowing towards this event. But here we do end up seeing more discussions between the group. First we're talking about what the plan is going to be after finding Clementine. In which we can advise Krista on where to go. Also we have Kenny being upset over the loss of the boat and him taking it out on Ben if he's still alive. To which Ben finally fights back. Which did feel like a great moment for his character with him calling out that he has lost his family too. And that Kenny at least got to say his goodbyes to his family. While well, Ben has to just assume that they're dead. Which is a satisfying moment of development for Ben here. And a nice progression of his relationship with Kenny. But then the mansion gets attacked by walkers, leading to a sequence that kind of feels like their last stand here, where we do get this pretty extensive action sequence that does lead to them escaping through the attic, where we do get a message from Clementine with her confirming that she is at the Marsh House, the hotel that her parents stayed at. Which really brings the story full circle here, ending up going to this location that was brought back all those episodes ago, but... Also here, Lee ends up getting into an argument with Kenny over his paranoia that Lee is going to turn, and this leads to another dumb minor choice here of getting the opportunity to have Lee to lose his temper and throw a stone head at a wall, which does seem kind of out of character for him at this point, though if you don't do it, then Kenny is the one to throw it instead, but either way, it shows that the wall is decaying, leading to us recognizing that we can break through to the room next door, which leads to a pretty great scene of Lee having these final conversations with the group here, reminiscing on the events of the game, and along the way, giving instructions to Amin and Krista on what to do with Clementine. With the intention here of having them clearly being the ones to be Clementine's guardians moving forward. But also, we have this final true conversation with Kenny that really highlights our prolonged history with him that ends up being a satisfying payoff to their relationship as well. But eventually, we do get to the sealed room where we do find a couple having killed themselves, which gives Kenny a nice moment where he realizes that this is a similar situation to what Katja did and ends up forgiving her for making that decision. But here he also ends up finding the couple's pistol, with him mentioning that there's only one bullet remaining, which might be relevant moving forward. But once we end up leaving the room by finding a balcony that we can jump off of to another rooftop, this is where the narrative branches off in what is probably the most radical change to this episode based on your choices, where while either way it ends with Kenny's presumed death, the way that this ends up occurring is radically different and to me, one of these scenarios is clearly better than the other. The better of these options being the one that occurs when Ben is alive, having been saved in episode 4, where Ben ends up being the last to jump from the balcony, and when doing so, the balcony collapses, leading to Lee and Kenny climbing down to rescue him, only for it to be revealed that he has been impaled by the railing, and after some failed attempts to pull him off, Ben's yelling ends up directing walkers in their direction, which ends up having Kenny get this heroic moment of telling Lee to go find Clementine, forcing him back to the rooftop while Kenny stays behind and uses his one bullet to put down Ben. And again, it is assumed that Kenny gets killed by the walkers here, though we never actually see it for ourselves. And really, neither scenario here ends up technically showing him dying, which does open up the window of him still being alive in future seasons, which obviously they take the opportunity of. But either way, this is a great send-off to Kenny here with him sacrificing himself for Lee, being a great payoff to their relationship, but also being a great payoff to Ben's relationship with Kenny putting Ben down, allowing Ben to avoid the situation that was his greatest fear of being eaten alive, while also giving Kenny this heroic exit. So again, I think all around, fantastic scene here. Now, in the scenario where Ben is already dead, the balcony obviously never ends up breaking, but the story progresses on the next rooftop. In the other scenario, this just ends up being a throwaway scene where nothing really happens. Here instead, we will have Kenny accidentally cause Lee to drop his walkie-talkie into the hole in the building, which strangely has Krista jumping in to retrieve it, though she struggles to get back up after doing so, where despite using a pole to try to help her up, she continuously slips and gains the attention of walkers, leading to Kenny sacrificing himself this way in jumping down to boost her up, 
and ends up being surrounded by walkers. And to be honest, this ending just simply doesn't work as well for me. Really, it doesn't feel like as satisfying of a payoff here, where again, like it would have been if we had a lot set up to this like Kenny Krista dynamic, but there really wasn't any, especially in comparison to the Kenny Ben dynamic. And also the entire situation of how this all starts by Kenny patting Lee on the back just seems super forced as well. So again, never like this route. But afterwards, we do end up reaching the waterfront with the Marsh House now in sight. But to reach the next rooftop, the group has to cross a sign with a massive crowd of walkers on the streets below. And here we do get another minor decision of whether Lee goes first or last. Where if he goes first, the sign instantly breaks stranding Omid and Krista on the other side. Well, otherwise, Krista and Omid make it through, but the sign still breaks. Either way, leaving Lee separated from Krista and Omid, and here you end up saying your farewells to them, and can officially give them permission to take care of Clementine, also telling them that they're going to meet up outside of town, but this leads to Lee jumping into the streets, where we do get this really badass moment, this big hero moment for Lee, as he fights his way through the walkers, hacking his way through them with this meat cleaver, and... This ends up being a somewhat annoying gameplay section realistically, where again, missing one target causes you to have to replay the entire scene, but it's still such a great scene for Lee, really showing his dedication and how resolute he is in getting Clementine back here, taking out all these walkers without fear. But then we reach the outside of the Marsh House, where Lee sees a car parked outside, which I missed the first time I played this game. But seeing this should make you realize that this is the same car from back in episode two, making the identity of the stranger clear to Lee at this point. But then we enter the Marsh House and eventually find a bedroom with a closet door rope shut, making it clear that this is the room that Clementine is being held in. Though at the moment that we near the door, the stranger appears behind him with his pistol drawn, forcing him to be quiet and drop all of his belongings in a position where you can lie to him and not drop everything, but like realistically, it doesn't play that major of a factor here. But this is where we get one of my personal favorite scenes in the entire game and probably in all of media, where we have this one-on-one -on -one discussion with the stranger, this cold, psychotic figure that has this darkly calm demeanor throughout all of this. And I really just love the stranger's portrayal here. While his writing can come off as a bit ridiculous here, especially in the scenario where Lee doesn't help out in taking the supplies, as at that point, it really makes no sense why the stranger has this big vendetta with you. But really, this entire scene is just a perfect culmination for this game. A discussion with a man that feels wronged by the choices you made in a game where it is propped up how important the choices you make are. And we have him proceeding to scold you for all the choices you have made. Again, a perfect conclusion for this game. And again, if you do take the supplies from him, this vendetta makes so much sense. Where we do learn that the stranger had lost his son the day that we took the supplies from him. And after him and his wife had returned from the search, they found the car empty, leading to his wife and daughter leaving him, only for him to find them days later already dead. A tragic backstory for this big villain reveal here, and in a way, makes you sympathetic with him initially, until you realize that he's been keeping his wife's reanimated head in his bag, really reminding you what a lunatic he is here, but he then reveals that he also has his own walkie-talkie that he's been using to monitor Lee since that event, and again ends up scolding Lee for his decisions, which through that is essentially scolding the player for decisions that you end up making, where he runs through many of the game's major events and uses those moments to justify his kidnapping of Clementine in order to protect her from the likes of Lee. And he ends up stating a line that has always lingered in my mind for some reason, where he tells Lee that he's a monster, a murderer, and a thief. And I want to hurt you so bad. And it's just such a ridiculous line. Another humorous element of this conversation is also him asking Lee how old Clementine is, only from the scold Lee for not recognizing that Clementine's birthday had just passed, where he says, wrong, she's nine, and that's always been a humorous line to me as well. But as the stranger begins to talk to his wife's severed head, we do see Clementine escape from her room, and if Lee had dropped his weapons, she ends up using them to attack him, just as he says that Clementine wouldn't hurt a fly, which leads to our final fight sequence as Lee, where the stranger's gun has been knocked across the room and we obviously struggle for it, but eventually we end up getting the upper hand on the stranger, where the stranger can die in a number of ways. Lee can choke him to death, which ends up being a pretty underwhelming outcome here for me personally, but the better outcome to me is where you decide to show the stranger mercy, and through doing so, the stranger ends up fighting back, getting the upper hand on Lee, leading to Clementine being the one to pick up the gun and kill the stranger herself 
which to me is the much more satisfying outcome for the story here, showing Clementine's development as a character, showing what Lee had taught her, and also showing that these lessons end up helping them here, and also giving you hope that Clementine will be able to survive beyond this without Lee. But obviously here we do have Lee and Clementine reuniting, where she apologized to him, where she clearly puts the blame of this entire situation on herself, while also noticing Lee's weakened state. Though with Lee knowing his time is limited, we do have to exit the room as quickly as possible, only for a walker to be right at the door, but it ends up ignoring Lee with him being covered in walker guts due to his fight across the street. But this makes Lee realize a hack here in now covering Clementine in walker guts herself in order to mask her from the walkers as well, during which Clem is clearly disgusted, though this doesn't becoming important knowledge for her in future seasons where she does use this to her advantage, once again showing you the lessons that Lee has taught her. But then the two end up walking along the street, with walkers ignoring them along the way, but conveniently Clementine at one point stops to look to the side, noticing her parents being part of this walker group, which obviously seems very convenient, but does at least conclude the storyline here, allowing Clementine to move on from this. But just as this happens, Lee ends up passing out, leading to the final scene of the game. A pretty lengthy one at that, with Lee awakening as Clementine had just lock them inside a jewelry store with the intention of keeping them safe here but instead now locking clementine in with the lee who is on the brink of death and about to turn and we do have these really depressing segments of lee barely being able to walk and not being able to get up after he falls but here we do get an extensive scene of him telling clem what to do first with tying him to the nearby radiator to stop him from attacking her and then we direct her in helping her escape from the store by getting some keys from a zombified security guard. And this leads to a tedious series of events that has you guiding her through every little step. And we have our final action sequence as the walker ends up chasing Clementine, which she eventually ends up killing and obtaining its gun, leading us to the end, where Lee informs Clementine that she has to shoot him. Though Clem doesn't know if she can do it, but also doesn't want Lee to become one of them, giving us our final major decision in the game in that we decide Lee's fate here, either having Clem shoot Lee or just leaving him to turn. Which again, to me, should be a clear-cut decision here. Shooting Lee is by far the best ending for this game in pretty much every single way. The other ending to me feels like such a cop-out. Where having Clem have the seal Lee's fate here further cements her development as a character here and also gives Lee this really poetic final moment that's just so perfect in my eyes and really just a tragic way to end Lee's story here. But along the way, we do get some more dialogue choices as we have our final conversation with Clementine, giving her these bits of advice, which she will continue to mention in future installments. Though some of these options are kind of ridiculous, but it does all lead to Lee's final moments, where again, to me, the final shot of Clem shakily pulling the trigger as it cuts to black immediately afterwards is the most satisfying outcome to me, as the other ending is literally just Clem leaving and screen fading to black as Lee scums to infection which is not as interesting, but something I do like here is that if Lee doesn't make a decision in time, Clem herself will make this decision based on the previous choices that you've made in her relationship, which is an interesting approach to this section as well. That was an option that I feel like most people don't end up using. But this isn't quite the end just yet, as we do get a great post credit scene here as well, where we do see Clementine tearfully walking through the outskirts of Savannah and end up seeing her sit down next to an abandoned car while inspecting some shotgun shells, seeming to mirror the opening to episode one, where Lee had obviously used a shotgun to kill his first walker immediately after a car crash. But Clementine ends up looking up and sees two human silhouettes in the distance who end up looking back at her, really setting up the continuation of this story, but also giving us a bit of an ambiguous ending here to where I would have been content if it had just ended here. Where I did feel like Lee and Clementine's relationship was wrapped up perfectly here. And while yes, it would have been cool to see Clementine utilize these lessons in future installments, which they do with very mixed results in future seasons, I never felt like it was an absolute necessity for me. But if we were going to get a cliffhanger here, I do feel like this is a cool way to do it. Now, obviously, the assumption is that these figures are Krista and Omid. Though I do love how this game doesn't fully commit to that, adding to the mystery of 
how the narrative will progress here, though, to be fair, even though it does end up being Chris and Omid, it doesn't really go in a direction that anyone could have predicted anyway, considering they're out of the picture almost instantly anyway, which does make the resolution to this cliffhanger a bit underwhelming, but doesn't stop this from being a great way to send off Season 1 in its own right. But with that, I mean, that's the entirety of Telltale's The Walking Dead Season 1, again, a game that radically changed the way I looked at the gaming medium, being an experience based almost entirely around its narrative and allowing for player agency in deciding how the story plays out, which again, can underwhelm people in how many of these choices end up being irrelevant. However, I do feel like this is one of the Telltale games that actually handles your choices the best, while also taking the world of The Walking Dead and telling a really compelling narrative within it introducing us to mostly new characters that I, again, adored. I, I love Lee as a character, and seeing his relationship with Clementine and Kenny evolving, I love the grim tone that the narrative exudes with the game following a similar philosophy as the Walking Dead comics and show, and in that most characters can just die at any given point, and most characters do die over the course of its narrative. And through that really just ups the tension throughout the entire game as you just never know what's actually going to happen. And again, I personally just really find this game iconic. It's one of the games that I've played the most, where I really know this game from beginning to end, from scene to scene. And again, many of this game's lines are just etched in my brain for some reason. I mean, The Walking Dead Season 1 is just a game that's so important to me, which is why I obviously decided to make this ridiculously long video to extensively talk about it. But with that, those are my thoughts on the main campaign of Season 1, 10 years after the release of its final episode. I'd like to continue with more Telltale retrospectives at some point down the road. I don't expect them to be as extensive as this one, as again, I did feel like this was a special one where I really wanted to go really in depth, but I will be doing one for The Wolf Among Us at some point next year before the second game releases, and we'll obviously continue with Walking Dead Season 2 at some point, and then move on from that point forward. So stay tuned for all of those, but for now, that is the video. Thank you for watching.